Hello, brothers and sisters of the Briar. Professor Jeremiah here. And Three Rivers. Welcome. And welcome back to the matinee. The pith helmet matinee, mm -hmm. I should say. <laughs> what are we smoking today, Professor? Well, I've got a little bit of Frogmorton cellar. Oh, you got oh. quite a, a bit still of that, savoring it bit by bit. I, I think I haven't taken count, but I probably have about maybe six to eight tens left. Mm. So oh. I'm, I can still go a little ways, uh, a little way on it, and we'll see. Um, it, it's it's just a blend that. I don't know if for my taste, if they'll ever have one that satisfies me because mm -hmm. other people will say, they'll say, well, this blend tastes a little like Frog Morton Cellar, but it won't have the whiskey barrel stave in it. And yeah. I think that's where most of the flavor comes from. Now, they only came with one stave, but I, when I jar it up, I have two in there. And so I always keep one of them as the fresh one, the freshest that came out of the, the jar. But I save my whiskey barrel staves too. I put them in some other blends and age them and treat them. Turn, they turn out a bit different. So what do, do you, you know what? Have? Sorry, Professor. What do you have in your bowl today? Uh, dark Flake, Gowerton and Hoggus, um, Dark Fire Malawi and Air Dried. Indian leaf. I, I've come to the conclusion, I do maybe use about two different tobaccos at once, but I don't go shooting around now. So I'll, I'll work my way through this. Um, and I am enjoying it in my professor's Northern Briars. Um, I was going to ask that the whiskey that was in the Frog Morton uh, that's absorbed into that wood, do you know what whiskey it was? I really don't. It's probably, I, I am not sure. Since I'm not a connoisseur, I really, I wouldn't be able to pick that taste out. Maybe somebody out know. there, they can let us know, put that information down in the bucket below. Because I've thought about putting some of these down in some whiskey, uh, the little staves and letting them soak it up and putting that with other blends to see what I can get out of it. Well, you do know the, I assume you know the recipe for Frog Morton, albeit it might not be precise. Well, you could, you could try and replicate it with a blend of your own. Um, and you'll know when you get there, won't you? Oh, I, yeah, I definitely yeah. I'll know. Be, sure. If someone knows, that would be marvellous, wouldn't it? Well, what I've even thought of doing is taking, you know, there's a couple of blends out there right now that are floating around that people compare to Frog Morton Cellar. And I've thought of taking those blends and then jarring them up with the yeah. whiskey barrel stave and letting them sit for a year or two and then seeing what I get. And I, then I might get closer to it. Well, I don't know the state that that was blended in, but if there's if it's bourbon or something of that nature close to, then one could assume it's gonna be that um, uh, blend of whiskey. Uh, so, but it'd be interesting if someone out there does know, I'm sure there's a few aficionados that can come to your aid. I'm, I'm sure there's somebody watching this that knows the full breakdown of the recipe. So maybe yeah. they'll let us know. Well, let's hope so. Have we got to Commander Bragg with us today? Is he having one off? We, we do know. We've got him queued up and, and ready to go. Now, mm -hmm. I noticed that you're sitting in a, in a different atmosphere today. It uh, looks like maybe you're in the, the hills of Tennessee or Kentucky or... That would be lovely. It, it's, it's Ohio or something. Yeah, well, it's in honor of our uh, mystery guest today. Oh, that's right. We have another mystery guest today. So you've transported yourself to near yeah. that location. So stay tuned and see who that <laughs> mystery guest is. It'll be revealed in a, in a short bit. So for now, let's see what the commander's up to today. Rock and roll. Elephants, remarkable creatures. Did I ever tell you of my amazing encounter with a giant elephant? Sorry, Commander, I must be going. I was on a lonely safari when suddenly... The natives dropped their surprise and began shouting, The natives vanished and I was left alone to face this wild, destructive beast. 
It seemed certain that I would be done in, until my keen eyes noticed a large thorn in the beast's left front hoof. With one quick jerk, the thorn was removed. Immediately, the beast was quiet. And from that moment on, he was my faithful friend. He followed me wherever I went, into Paris, where he encountered the Eiffel Tower, into London, where he bumped into the Royal Palace, on to America, where he stumbled into the Empire State Building. My goodness, however did you get rid of him? Hmm, yes. Quite often, he still finds me, and... Surely, Commander, you don't expect me to believe... Commander? Commander! That was a, a, I think a biblical text in there somewhere, Professor. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of a story of a of a missionary who had helped an elephant one time get out of a trap. And years later, that missionary was at a zoo in the U.S. Wow! And he saw this elephant looking at him through the cage, and he connected eye to eye with that elephant and he knew that it had to be that elephant that he had helped out all those years before and so the man he slipped in to the enclosure where the elephant was and he walked up and the elephant held his head down low and started kind of swinging his trunk back and forth smelling the man and and everybody was all afraid and that the man turned back and said you know, no, 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 it's okay, people. I know this elephant. And and he said, I helped this elephant years ago. And, and he started rubbing the elephant's trunk. And the next thing, the elephant wrapped his trunk around the man's leg and started pounding him on the ground and threw him out of the enclosure. And when he was there, all the people gathered around him and he said, no, it wasn't that elephant. <laughs> uh, but I, I, you know, I've had a lot of close encounters with with elephants in the wild before, and one of the one of the best ones. I think I mentioned this on a video way way back in the archives. But we were bird watching, and there was a Welshman in the park who was in charge of the anti poacher patrol, and we had gone out because he said there was this particular bird that only migrated through the park for like a two week period of the year and that bird was there in the park at that time and it would come down into the springs uh, the warm springs of the park so we were out a little ways from the main part of the the park where the warm spring would flow into the main river and slightly dangerous because there was hippos there there were crocodiles there but we're down in the water chest deep watching these birds which he was enthralled by i was just enjoying the adventure of being on the safari and all of a sudden here came the elephants and they walked right through within probably 20 to 30 feet of where we were in the river so thankfully they didn't step on us but <laughs> uh, but anyway uh, fun fun adventures for sure yeah they probably thought you were another animal yeah yeah, just to, they just ignored us. But back then we had a, a he had, a, I believe he had a 303 Ensfield and I had a double barrel shotgun, which he had, which the, the park uh, owned. So we were at least a little armed for where we were at. Not that that would have helped against elephants, might would have scared them away. That was more for the crocodiles. Well, I went on search after learning about Uncle Phil having been uh, in Hong Kong. And I believe I was able to uncover some archival footage of Uncle Phil in Hong Kong. And so I thought we would take a little gander at this video. Now, uh, I don't know what its origins were as far as where it came from. You're going to see a British flag up in the corner and I think it says something about anarchy that has nothing to do with us. I don't know if it has anything to do with Uncle Phil, but I believe this is some archival footage of his time that he spent in Hong Kong. 
So let's wow. take a look at this. Brilliant. St. Bruno rough cut, ready rubbed for the pipe. Smoothly satisfying flavor. A pipe does something for a man. St. Bruno does something more. St. Bruno rough cut. That is uncanny. I, I I think you're right on the nail there, Professor. I, we uncovered his time there, didn't we? <laughs> I think he's done an excellent job. Yeah, it, bring back old memories for him, I suppose. Yeah, and now we know maybe he had to leave because he has had so many women chasing him there. I think that's why he mentioned he couldn't find any pipe tobacco. He's trying to throw you off the scent. It it goes to show that if you were there with some pipe tobacco, you might not have a whole bunch of, you know, women young chasing you all about. Young ladies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I may have to go shop broad shopping in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> that's just our little secret, isn't it? No one else is going to know. Uh, nobody will know. That's all right. <laughs> Well, uh, would you like to introduce our mystery guest for today? Well, I, I'll let you do that, but I'll I give a bit of background. Um, he's a gentleman, a fine gentleman, a young man. Most people are young compared to me anyway, but he's a family man. Um, he has a young daughter. He lives in Ohio, if I can say that, on the Kentucky border. He's been smoking... Um, pipe for about two years now and he start he has a youtube channel he's just got over 100 subscribers now about 125 i think and his videos are really intriguing and it, it's great that he's agreed to come on and share some time with us and hopefully we can develop his channel with him and because he's got such a lot to offer uh it, He's he's invested into this channel with, with it from the pipe smoking community side, and he's he's experimenting with different tobaccos, and he, he's uh, yes, very enjoyable uh, person to speak to. Well, as we'll find out, but a lovely channel to tune into and enjoy. Yeah, no, he's kind of turned the the pith helmet matinee into a bit of a family. Uh, evening for them uh, and and he's been commenting before he knew that he was going to be a guest on here so i i felt like he was it's very fitting and you know i know he's low in the subscribers he's relatively new to the community new to pipe smoking and i, I felt though like he was a good fit if we were going to have somebody to begin with and branching out with some people who are unknowns uh relatively for the people here in the community so uh we had a excellent interview with him uh, i know this is this is kind of pre-interview here uh but it, it it's it's great to have somebody new to come in and somebody that's excited about the hobby and we're going to learn his wife is very supportive of his hobby as well so are you well, with, without further delay, here's the Angling Piper. Oh, Adam, Adam, welcome. As our guest, our ambassador from the YTPC, I'm so pleased you've joined us. So honored to be here. Oh, tell you what, the honor's ours. It certainly is ours. It's so pleased. Um, Adam, I, I hope you don't mind. I, I, I normally ask a few questions uh, nothing too searching and if anything there it says well i'm not really up to speed on that just say um but fundamentally you've been smoking now about two years is it two years two years and then um, your youtube channel you started about two months ago three months yeah yeah so in that respect people who are watching this hopefully might get some inspiration from you for starting their channel and 
and you're still in, and I listening, and I've seen all your videos in as much. I know how you've been putting things together. So yeah. we'll probably get into that a bit later on. So yeah, well, if, we're, we're, I, I wanted to say we're glad to have you, and you're uh, you're a different person to have it in the interview because others are well well known in a sense. Uh, most everybody I think has over 500 subscribers and. Uh, you're a little under 200, aren't you? And, yes, uh, uh, 125. I told the wife, I said, this week must be a uh, rookie week. Yeah. Well, that's, we wanted to show that this isn't just isolated to, to the old timers out there, uh, that we can get some young blood, new blood in here as well. So uh, that's a part of why we wanted to have you in with us. And uh, I, I bet after this uh, interview, you'll see your numbers go up. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, they won't be going down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, up to now, we've had guests from South Africa, Texas, and England. I, I think, if I'm correct, tell me if I'm wrong, Ohio. Ohio. Yeah, and you're on the borders of Kentucky. I'm real close to Kentucky. There you go. So I'll. With no more hesitation, I'll, I'll go into those sort of uh, searching questions. The first one, and I, this will be interesting because I've listened to your and watched your videos, is if, uh, what is, and I'm going to ask, not a brand, okay. but what's your favorite blend? And by that, it could mean which do you smoke the most because I know you don't call yourself one or the other. But in a blend of leaf or tobacco, we, we, what do you look for, at, let's say, in general? Since, like you said, I don't call myself one or the other, it's kind of a two-part answer. Half yeah. of me is oriental blends. I always go towards the more oriental uh, Latakia blends. And then the other half of me goes to anything with black Cavendish. When I get a sweet right. tooth, it's that black Cavendish. I think you've got a lot in common there with the professor, with the, the black camera dish. Am I right, professor? Oh, absolutely. I found that that's my, that's my go-to, where some people are in it for the Burleys or in it for the Pariks or Virginias. I, I look for one with a good black Cavendish for sure. Well, this, the, you may, he may have to give us a, I generally will say I just need one example now. Uh, uh, now, this is a, a, a productive blend. You're going into the tobacconist. Everything is, is accessible to you. Which is a tobacco containing that cannabis you're likely to pick off the shelf, let's say, first, which is the one? If they've got Lane BCA, it's coming home with me. Well, there we go. Well, I have no idea. That's a whole new alphabet to me. <laughs> It's Seriously? basically just black Cavendish. It's lame. Oh, is it? Yeah, right. it's it's a straight black Cavendish. A lot of people use it for mixing in with other blends. I just put it right in the pipe and smoke it by itself. Brilliant. I, who actually produces that, Adam? Uh, Lane Limited. Which is Lane? Yes, right. Lane Limited. Okay. Lane is One Q it? is their most famous one. I'm pretty sure. Right. Yeah. Would that be? Excuse my ignorance. Would that being um. Edgeworth in the day. Edgeworth? I'm not sure. All right, well, swiftly moving on. That was something I, I smoked back in the 70s that used okay. to come in contraband from America with a friend of mine. Where you live, I don't know, I've seen you going down the highway there when you, you were talking in one of your videos. Um, not necessarily within uh, a five minute, it might be your own porch, it could be anywhere, but where... Where do you find the most enjoyable areas in particular in your part of the country? Since we do live in a very vast part of the country, there's not a whole lot of towns or cities. Yeah. Cincinnati is about an hour from us. That's our big city. Um, yeah. But we have so many parks and rivers and streams. Oh, uh, right. It is so nice. To, you can load up the family and drive 10 minutes any direction and find the best fishing hole you've been to. You know, there's a thing, a fishing hole. When you talk about river, so is that like a, a small pond or lake when you say a hole, or is it in a river where there's a hole? 
the here expect- in the states, our our good spots is pretty much what we refer to as the fishing hole. It doesn't have to be. You can oh, have right. a good fishing hole in a river. That's right. that's our our spot. You know. I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> um, oh, here's one for you. I don't know if you've even got time for this, but do you have any other hobbies or interests apart from your own personal pipe smoking? I'm an avid hunter, fisherman, of course. Uh, right. Actually, I'm a fur trapper, too. That's my other big hobby, is fur trapping. Wow. Now, I when you're fur trapping, what particular animal is producing the fur for you? Raccoons, foxes, coyotes. Oh, yeah. We, we've talked about raccoons a few times, haven't we, Professor? Oh, uh, we professor- have. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to talk with you later about something that I need... Uh, that I'm going to make a tamper for three rivers here. Hey. Swift, <laughs> swiftly moving on. I might say that a lot while we're having I need that. something from a raccoon. Yeah. Okay. Is I it? already know what you're oh. talking about. <laughs> oh. Tell me. He'll be tell excited, me, won't he? Tell me to take... <laughs> I thought you were man of the cloth. Um, when I was four... And it just reminds me, we were on holiday in a place called Blackpool. It's a seaside resort. They call it the Las Vegas of the north in England. Um, and you have a tower there similar to the Eiffel Tower. And we're in this audience. I'm four years of age. They said, right, are there any youngsters want to come up on the stage and sing a song? And if you do, you get a stick of, do you know what rock is? It's a candy. And they roll it in a way that they have okay. a, a letter in it, so a stick of Blackpool rock. And I'm thinking, I, I'm having that. And I, my, one, and here's one we've never mentioned before. One of my old, still is, I suppose, Davy Crockett. So I went up there. There's the microphone. There's the audience. I've got the stage, and I'm singing three verses of Davy Crockett. Right. I get me stick of rock. They thank me for it. And when they finish, every kid in the audience got a stick of rock. So I felt a bit hard done to on that one. And you've just opened that wound again. Would, would you like to sing a couple of lines of it right Absolutely now? Absolutely not. Let me think well, about that. No. We, we, we can, we can, Davy, Davy Crockett. You you king of the wild frontier. <laughs> well, the thing is, he had, was it a raccoon hat he used to have on? Yeah, coonskin. Yeah, uh, yeah cuz I I pinched my grandmother's uh, stole that she used to wear around for so sort of wrap that up. And I used to go off playing David Crockett in the garden. <laughs> I think she forgave me. Uh, here's one for you. Your good lady wife. Hey, yes. what, a, what a support act you've got there. And I, I, oh, I mean, I'm blessed in the same way so much. But just surmise now, Adam, it's early evening. Your good lady is giving you a feast. Okay, you've had a wonderful, and I know you talk about English blends and aromatics is the, the meat and the, the sweet, but now you've had your lovely meal. Okay, you've got your sweet tea there, whatever you, I know you like your tea. I do. And you're going out onto your porch when you've finished your log cabin. You, you may have one as good as this, probably. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you've got your favorite tobacco, whichever one you, you pinned on it. And you're just going to pick a pipe out of the rack. Now, you're not going fishing. You're going to sit down in your rocking chair and you're going to just savor that lovely meal and think about, you know, all the good things in life. Which pipe would you pick up? That's an easy question. Yeah. <clears throat> that has to be my Masterson freehand. Right. Very nice. Well, well, well that was that's a, a great answer. And the thing is, um, and I might be wrong on this occasion, you buy your corn cobs and they're always straight. I mean, I, I know you like a, a countryman, and I've got one here, but it's got the uh, the bend. I I've got yeah. another one with a straight piece on. But your briars are all estate pipes, aren't they? And you buy, and you buy straight. I do, yep. You don't, yeah. So is that, because that looked absolutely pucker. Is that, is that an estate pipe that you've yeah. got there? Really? Wow. Yep. Yeah, like you said, all my briars are estates. That's an estate. Yeah. 
My Masterson's in the state too. Now, here's you, a, a question I have for you is, yeah. how many bowls do you tend to smoke in a day? In the summertime when I'm working, um, it's usually one bowl a day. I'm not one that it's not an all day thing, but usually I will have one bowl at least a day. Now in the wintertime, my wife's a teacher. So, uh, and I'm off during the winter. So it's just me and the little girl. So my smoking gets cut back drastically when I'm home with the little one. So it could be once a week in the winter time. Okay. Now, how many pipes do you currently have? I have 12 pipes as of right now. Okay. Nearly as many as me. I said 17 the other day and the professor said that can't be right. I've recounted 21 now. <laughs> Now, you also have a collection of, you like old-fashioned basic tools, don't I you? I do. Yeah, and you, yeah. I, I know yeah. you, do you play golf? I do not. I do not golf. No, I, it's just that you, you were assessing these tools, and I just like a golf club, like with the side yeah. that you have there. And there's a, an interesting piece of kit there with sort of co blade combs on either side. I don't know if you sort of go from side to side with that yeah. one. Yep. Yeah. You just use your momentum, carry it on through and cut yeah. as you're going. Yeah. So that was, um, that was in my mind when I, I saw that. Um, Adam, I, I don't know if you, in, in life's experiences, I don't know, is there a particular time or story you, you might want to share with us in those life I could share the story of how this home got started. Wow. Well, yeah, that, that'd be good. Please. Uh, when the wife and I got married, we decided to go ahead and build a home together. And I was just going to go ahead and build a, what we call stick built home, you know, just what any contractor would do. I'm not a contractor by trade. I did take some uh, contracting carpentry classes when I was in college. Um, but most of what I can build is just from what my father's taught me and just from experience itself. But uh, then we got to talking about building a log cabin. So we ended up, we got a bigger, better chainsaw, went out into the woods here on our farm and cut down the trees ourselves, hauled them all off with the tractor, took them into the sawmill, had them, uh, it's called a D cut log where you square them on three sides and leave the outside rounded. Yeah. So we had the sawmill do that, brought them back here. Um, I had a, it's called a draw knife. It's just a straight blade. Oh yeah. With, okay, a draw knife. I took a draw knife and took the bark off of every log. Um, we went through, stacked them ourselves. Just me and my dad had been the only ones to do anything except I had the foundation poured. We built the cabin on uh, a concrete foundation. And then uh, I did have somebody come in and put the roof on because I'm not so keen on heights. Mm -hmm. So I did have somebody come put the roof on. Now, when you're building a log cabin as such, yeah. you're going to be going to get expansion and contraction or is yes. it the wood? And how do you allow for that? Is it like... There's a synthetic mud that I actually bought. It's called chinking. Uh, the company oh, I yeah. went through is Log Jam. I just went in each crevice and in between every log and put in a layer of that log jam to keep that space. And I can treat it as it grows and shrinks with weather. And then I did the same thing around every window and every door, put that chinking real thick in there to allow for the expansion. That way we don't bust a window or one day we can't open the door. <laughs> so like in a plinker boat, you use like a corking. Is that yeah. Yep. Yeah, I did some of it with a uh, mason trap, but then others I used a caulking gun. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I admire you tremendously what you're doing there. I mean, I um, I mean, I have a I call it a bothy. A lot of people call it a shed for some reason. Uh, but <laughs> during the now where we've had a bit of heat, everything's contracted. It's, must be twenty odd years old now, but I keep you know uh, repairing it, taking timber out, putting timber back in. And just now I've been putting some uh, all-weather caulking in uh, where it's just um, 
contracted and there's a little bit of daylight there now but it, it seems to work and then when it expands again it just crushes it and it's yeah, yeah. now so, what kind of wood have you used for your uh, logs cool is it a variety or hard okay yep we have a lot of tulip poplar here uh it's one that dries hard and doesn't get the rot and it isn't we have what it's called emerald ash borers uh, here and it's killed a lot of the trees in this area a lot of the hardwoods but uh, they don't mess with the tulip poplars now of course your boar bees and carpenter ants they'll mess with it but uh, i found uh it's a stuff that gets mixed in with your stain that you can put in there it's called they call it bug juice so when i go to stain the cabin i just put that in there and it keeps the bugs from coming in bad so was well, i was uh, curious if you had bought a kit because I know that that's a pretty popular thing for buying right. kits. That's what everybody always assumes when to... I say I'm building a log cabin. No, I I'm building a log cabin. <laughs> yeah, that's neat. That uh, to me that'll definitely have a lot more personal value right. than just buying a kit because the material uh, came up, right off my farm. A, yeah, growing up we had had a. a uh, hurricane that hit the coast. I believe it was Hurricane Frederick. I, I'm not not certain now, but hit the coast. Now I was in Birmingham, so a pretty good ways from the coast. But uh, we lost a number of pine trees in my parents' yard, and so my dad took those pine trees and made a log cabin for me. While other uh, children had tree houses, I had a log cabin in the backyard. So uh, it was <laughs> pretty pretty fun to have that in the it didn't it had a flat roof on it so that was still you know kind of got me up and you know a little bit like a tree house in that sense but the flat roof was made with the decking from box cars uh my my grandfather worked uh, for pullman standard box car company and so i had a tongue and grooved uh roof on top of that but yeah i got to got to play jeremiah johnson quite a bit in that log cabin Uh, Adam, you you were uh, having a dabble at the old St. Bruno not long ago with uh, Flake. How, how did you find it? Or have you not got to it? I have not got to that one yet. I'm mm -hmm. going to save that one for a first impressions video. Um, I didn't want to even open the tin until I record it, you know. Do you know what I... You're... You've got a lovely family. That comes through. Because I know how supportive you're... Uh, well, one, your wife is, and I think your daughter and yourselves sit down to watch these uh, matinees. Yeah, we do. Yeah, this is a family thing for us. We uh, oh. we watch YouTube every night before bed together. Uh, my daughter calls these whistles. She says, right. uh, you're going to watch whistle videos with daddy. <laughs> oh, how old is she, Adam? May I She's two. Oh, wow. Brilliant. Fantastic age. Um the thing is, your good lady helps pick out the tobaccos. She does. And she buys I figured you. that was fair because she's the one that has to smell it. So <laughs> Yeah. Now there's one she didn't like. Sherlock said, Holmes does not like it at all. That, that was it. I've never tried Sherlock Holmes. She um, says it reeks on me. Reeks. Yeah. You said you liked it, right? I like the taste now. I've got to change my clothes after a while after I've smoked it because it does have a, an unpleasant odor on the person. Yeah. But what about the, um, now I, I know that you had mentioned the vanilla custard. What was your end feeling of vanilla custard? Again, I haven't got to uh, that sample yet. That's going to oh, be another first impressions video. I got you. Well, I, that that's one you can smoke around your wife and, See, see what she says about I'm that. I'm excited for that one. When I first opened the box, it just hit me and like, okay, I did not order enough of this. <laughs> yeah. Cage Coat Cavendish, I had some friends that per, uh, were up in Gatlinburg not too long ago and they bought a, uh, I guess a pound of it for me. And when they came back, the wife didn't want to let go of it because she said it was a nice air freshener for their car. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she she was wanting to hang on to it. <laughs> Excellent first half of the interview, wouldn't you say? I mean that that was great. We will have to split this up into two. You know, I I didn't know whether 
uh, him being a new pipe smoker, if we would have that much to talk about, but we, we covered a wide range of topics, didn't we? Well, Adam's been quite transparent in his, his uh, production. So there's a lot of material there that, you know, embroiders his lifestyle and what he's doing at the moment and the support of his family, his good lady wife. And, I mean, uh, he has an enjoyment of, of things old, kind of nostalgic life. Uh, yeah. As far as, you know, uh, I know having an appreciation for older tools. Recently, he was, you know, I guess got a couple of, uh, what, a scythe and then a swing blade and was showing those. And, uh, you know, it's, not, it's tools that a lot of people don't really use anymore, but very practical. There's times that just having a lawnmower or a weed eater is not very practical. But, they, you know, having an appreciation for older stuff, I, I can always admire somebody who mm. has that. Uh, and that swing blade, I've never seen that piece of kit before, of which he delivered in his production on his own channel. So I'm looking forward to seeing it develop. And uh, he's so enjoying it, so full of passion and enthusiasm. Um, yeah, I'm enjoying our fellowship as we go along on this. Well, I had another uh, video of which uh, you, I think, had uncovered this one of, of Chris Yates. And I wanted to just show this. We're going to come back later with even another one from our discussions, which in, ensued. But I thought that this was an interesting clip. And just, I know we, we've we talked a lot about fishing in this interview. The the matinees aren't all about fishing, but that's that's his interest. And that's a part of what we knew in having him in here. Yeah. So I, I know that our last two folks, we've gotten into fishing. So yeah. have no fear if you're if you're saying, oh, that's the Pith Helmet Matinee is all about fishing. No, it's about adventure. It's about living life. And this is a this is a clip that I believe most people can connect with. I hope so. so. Yeah. So we're we're gonna go to that clip right now and just have a little look at it. Retracing their childhood roots, Bob and Chris have returned to fish Frencham Little Pond for tench. But one of the joys of angling is catching the unexpected. Bob has caught one of Britain's most beautiful fish, the rudd. And it was when catching lovely creatures like this as children, not as big as this of course, that they were taught the fundamental rule of coarse angling, that fish unless the highly edible sort should not be killed. So they soon learn to touch and admire without causing harm, and take their reward from seeing them swim back into the mysterious depths, as perfect as their dream. This is going to be a sight to amaze you, slowly. There, what do you think about that? Oh, wow. About 30 times as long as your minnow. <gasps> Several hundred times as heavy, oh. but they're all they're all beautiful, big barbies. Look at that one coming in. Big fish. It's nearly ten pounds. Would you like to have a crack at one of these barbels? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like to try and catch one. Let's see what we can do here. You take the rod. I'll bait up for you. <laughs> Two grains of sweet corn. Right. Away you go. Just make everything nice and slow and. Deliberate and don't make any sudden moves. And they won't mind us. That's it, that's it. That's it, good. Right in front. Now we will wait. Ooh, look at those. Yeah, they're all there. Big fish. Look at that. Can you see that big one over there? That's big. Look, coming in. He's going straight for your bait. He's got it. What? Don't strike. No, don't strike. Wait. Wait, steady. Ow. Yeah! You got one! <laughs> Good. Well done. Go! Oh, you got one? Yeah. That's it. Whoa! 
All right. Now that first fish that they were catching, uh, t- tell us a little bit about that. Cause I'm, I'm not familiar with the one they were, I the guess it, Bob and Chris were first catching. The rod, it's uh, much sought after. It doesn't get to a, a large size. I think that was one of the finest examples you, you find. And um, they're trying to protect the rod because other fish will interbreed with it in the wild. So they, they've restricted people stocking fish up. There's an old practice where they would use a live bait to go and catch things like pike. So they take something like a, a rod or something similar, a skimmer, and they go to wherever they're going and they put this live bait on, they're swimming around and the pike could take it. Well, those, some of those fish would escape and then they breed, say, with the rud and it, it dilutes the, the species. <laughs> it, that practice of a live bait, I've never used it. I, I find there is no need for it. And But thing is, as generations passed, it was one of the ways that, they used to, to catch uh, fish. Now, can and, you still use can you use minnows? Well, that's a, probably considered a live bait so much, is it? No, no. I, I, would, I, would, I think it's been banned altogether. I'm not a, a coarse fisher, so it, it's an area, and um, there's no rud where I go fishing, but it's a beautiful fish, as you could see. The the second fish there was a barbel. And they are very strong fighters. They're never taken for food that I'm aware of. And that young lad there, he'd just been coming along the bank with a jar of minnows in a little jar, been catching in a net. And Chris had invited him to go and fish with him. And they nicknamed this lad Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> Huckleberry Finn. And he caught that huge barbel. And there it was on film, you know, as it happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was fishing a bit further down the, the river there. So a marvellous moment for that would not be a young man now. You know, he, he probably got a family of his own. But that's the way it should be, passing on that that skill and that um, respect. For, well, for, in that video, he has him fishing with sweet corn. Yes. And that's something that I had never heard of anybody doing, but I used to do that. But I've yeah. never heard else now, I always caught catfish when I would fish with sweet corn but that is that is the first time I've ever seen anybody else doing it now maybe it's a common practice but I was unfamiliar with the other people doing it and the only reason why I did it as a child was because there was a few times that we were out of bread or we didn't really have anything else a suitable bait at the time so I just plopped some corn on there and that's the yeah. time about but the thing is, at sweet corn, the green giant used to come in a tin. And that's yeah. what we used to do, put it in a plastic tub and we'd go off. And i go down to the canal here in years gone past and I'd put a bit of ground bait in. I'd mix up maybe some molasses and some bread and some sweet corn, mix it all up. And you throw every time I took the dog out going along the canal, I'd throw a bit in. So when I went fishing, you know, it's like the dinner gong. There's some more coming, and then they come into the swim. But, yeah, that, that and luncheon meat I used to use, little cubes of luncheon meat. And that's when you get the not just the perch and the, the tench, but you, that's when the eels would come in because they'd pick up on that scent. Well, I've, uh, I've used hot dogs to fish for catfish before. Chop, you know, cut up a hot dog and put it in there, so... That worked out. That worked out pretty good. So, but I mean, you know, for that young boy, I mean, he'll remember that. And now it's, you know, it's documented. It's not just a a memory, but he can actually, you know, watch that video over and over. But I believe these videos are released as a a DVD series, aren't they? Correct. I'll I'll put a link down in the bucket below for the video series because there may be some folks out there interested in them and. Just to give them a, a little plug for, for their video series, I guess you... Please do. They, they were filmed over a, a period of time, weren't they? Yeah, they, they, yes. I, I'm not sure if it was 18 months or... They, they went over a season, you know, through each of the four seasons and what was available to fish for. And they actually did one called In Search of Salmon, I think it was. And they start off on this river 
and Bob James is fly fishing and Chris Yates, as always, is late and he's coming down and you see an owl in there and they decided they would go to Scotland to fish for the, they call the silver tourist because the salmon is a migratory fish coming back up the river. But in that early sequence, you can't, I cannot find it anywhere that's available on the public domain is where he gets his dog. It, I, I keep calling him retrievers, more apt to be a, a Labrador retriever, actually swam out. And instead of using a landing net, the dog actually collected the, the trout at the end of the line and swam back. It's actually on that DVD in search of salmon. And they do go up to Scotland and they've got this old Land Rover. It, and they live in a, they stay in a both and they end up, oh, it's just boys' own adventure. Um, it's, don't, you know, don't worry if you, you, you're not into fishing. You know, these, these, they, they camp out on the side of these lakes and they've got the dogs with them. You're seeing with the children. It's a life experience. It is a life experience. And the photography and the narration and the music, it, it, it is an experience. And any young person watching that with the, with the mum and dad, it's just good, wholesome, innocent entertainment. Do you sometimes sing along with the music? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I believe it is the second half of the interview where I said this, or it even could have been post-interview. But one of the things that I had pointed out is for me, a lot of times fishing was just a part of a time filler when we were camping because I, I enjoy camping. I'm all about the camping. And I don't like cleaning fish that much, but not many people do. But I, I do enjoy cooking it. I, I just, I love the idea of camping. And, you know, I know not everybody out there is a camper, but that's something for me. I, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, just being out camping. I long for that time again. I'm hoping that kind of things here will, will level out a bit and I can, get back out and do some camping again soon. Uh, nothing better than being out in the woods, whether you're with the, a couple of other folks or even by yourself, it's, uh, it's nice. Well, if I may, I'm sorry if I'm exhausting the fishing, but uh, in the younger days, a good friend of mine and myself, we camped out on a, a river in North Wales called the River Banwick. And uh, when the water was down, there was shale. And we actually got the Kelly kettle out and we were making a brew on there. And I don't harvest fish that much, but uh, we did take a couple of trout that time. And the next day for breakfast, we had trout and bacon. That was an experience with a nice pot of tea brewed up in the Kelly kettle. So you were singing a little song for us earlier, weren't you? <laughs> I was helping you sing a song, and <laughs> you want to sing Davy Crockett again? Have you rehearsed? Nein, schlicht. A Fifth Amendment. I like that amendment. Do Do you remember who the uh, Do you remember who the uh, actor was in that? No, oh, I don't. He, he was uh, Davy Crockett to me. He wasn't an actor. He was. He Davey was and he was also he also played Daniel Boone. Do you remember that? The same the same uh, actor. Yeah. Oh crikey, I can see him now, but I just don't know the name of him, Professor. No. Enlighten me. Well, you know, I'm I'm a collector of autographs. And I have a couple of friends that occasionally they'll run across an autograph and send one to me. And so uh in my guest bedroom here is called the cowboy room. And so somebody who knows that I collect autographs and knows that the bedrooms, the cowboy room sent me this since we've been on lockdown. So that's why it's unframed at this point. That's him. And what was his name, professor? Bess Parker. I didn't know that. I, in fact, that name doesn't resonate with me at all. He was. David was Crockett. I don't know whether this one was Daniel Boone or Davy Crockett. I know, uh, you know, he had a sidekick, and the sidekick was played. Sidekick was played by Buddy Epson, 
And they also sent me that autograph, but I don't have it here on my desk. Oh, that's a blast from the past. Buddy Epson being Jed Clampett, of course. Yeah, so, but I tell you... It, it, I can't remember it, which one of the two, but it's just, you know, the actor played both people. So as a child, that's a bit confusing. Mm. But, <laughs> but you know, maybe we can pull out some, you know, footage of you singing that song. I was four years of age. <laughs> and I did get a sticker rock for it. <laughs> Maybe when your grandson's around next time, you can teach that to him and get him to sing it. <laughs> I think I've sung it to him, actually. I don't know all the, the lyrics now, though. There you go. Well, no, you it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, Professor. Oh, Quick. you got a lot of time to rehearse. Yeah. Moving swiftly on. Well, as we, bring this, as we bring this episode to, to a close, you know, as we're out there seeking the next person to be interviewed, I have a little tip and especially just to, to, for you to keep this in mind too, as you're seeking out people to be interviewed, that here's a little tip. So let's, let's see this video. So you will, you will be able to keep in mind and myself as well, how the future people that we seek out to be interviewed. We tried to reach out to the man who died in this pursuit. Uh, they were unavailable for comment. Micah, back to you. We tried to reach out to the man who died in this pursuit. Uh, they were unavailable for comment. Micah, back to you. We tried to reach out to the man who died in this pursuit. Uh, they were unavailable for comment. So, what have you learned? <laughs> I've learned that she could well get a job with the BBC, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Is that controversial? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, brothers and sisters, we're glad that you tuned into this episode of the Pith Helmet Matinee. I hope that you're enjoying these interviews. Uh, part two, hopefully, will be available on Monday. Uh, we're not meaning to hold you in suspense. We just know you don't want to be here for two hours, right? <laughs> uh, it doesn't seem that long. Professor. Oh. <laughs> Am I biased? <laughs> I apologize to the BBC for that. <laughs> well, all right, brothers and sisters, uh, thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, God bless. Yes, take care and stay safe. Whoa! That's what I'm talking about! <laughs>